Oh, we're back. It's been about an hour and some change. We did a couple other things. Had a little sandwich. Played fetch with the cat. So it's still running away here. I'll tell you what, we'll bump up to the next light bulb, which is uh, 40 watts. And this is just me. You can advance this as quickly as you want. Now we got about 106 volts DC. And what do we got here? About 90 volts of AC. So we're still short a little bit, but not bad. Okay, little friendly tip. Old FM radios are kind of fussy about the power supply voltages. So if you get it up this far, get the radio up and running this far, and you switch to FM and don't hear anything, don't be too surprised. Um, usually that's because the, the local oscillator inside is a little grumpy, especially at those higher frequencies. You're definitely in the uh, megahertz range here at those local oscillator frequencies on the FM side. The AM side, not so much. It's, well, I don't know. We can do that. I'm going to give that control a little shot cleaner. different cleaners. Um, some of them are very expensive, but you, and it seems like in the cleaner business, especially the aerosol cleaner business, you get what you pay for. So I'm going to tilt this up. Yeah, I noticed someone was very naughty and didn't get their uh, Didn't get their uh, little cardboard to put over the speaker or the I don't want to say the plastic. Um, this particular cleaner is a CRC brand. You can get this at one of the home centers, who shall remain nameless. And it says uh, improves electrical properties, whatever that means. It is safe for plastic, and I've had reasonable luck with it. It isn't my favorite one, but it is relatively inexpensive. It's something you can get locally. No. Just give it a tiny little shot. And I'm gonna go ahead and lay this back down. And we'll hook the power spawn back up. Give that control a little working. I'm not a big fan of spraying things, but there are some of those sprays that work very well. Uh, one of the ones I really do like, but it's expensive, is uh, wherever the can disappeared to. Good thing they aren't my sponsor, they'd be getting pissed. Oh, here it is. Uh, it's made by this company. They make a number of cleaners. This is an older can. I don't know if they still make this exact formulation, but I believe they do. This is a deoxid. It's pretty expensive, but it does work. And they got a number of different, uh, what do I say, mediums. You can get it in a spray or little pins or little like fingernail bottles with little brushes. It's expensive stuff, but it does work. Okie dokie. Yeah. So how are we doing here? We seem to be doing pretty good. So, radio's ramping back up. Can barely hear it. That did a pretty good job. Turn it off real quick here. This might be a good time to also um, put a tiny drop of oil. There's a little bearing right here surface. 
and there's a number of different things you can use to do that. There are a number of uh, petroleum based products that work fine. Uh, the kind of the secret to all those is uh, all things with moderation. Don't put too much um, in there. Just maybe a tiny drop and let it get in there. It's a little scratchy, but a lot better. Yeah. Well, we're doing pretty good. We haven't done anything hardly. Not in the real world. Well, I'll tell you what. How about we turn that off and how about we switch gears and go to FM, see how much trouble we're going to have. So we switch to FM and we're going to tempt fate here and see if we can get this to run on reduced voltage. Probably not so much. I still haven't seen the chassis number anywhere on this thing. Oh, here we go. It's an H37T7. So we can look that up. It's pretty quiet. That's funny. Huh. Weird. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, let's try something here. What I'm doing here is I'm ex flipping over the cheater cord. I'm exchanging the two contacts. Let's see what happens here. These radios usually run on about probably 130 volts DC to uh, probably to the audio stage. And it's regulated or knocked down from there. Hmm, that doesn't look good. Okay, that's weird. Is that coming up or going down or what's that doing? That doesn't look good. Well, let's see here. Oop, heard something. Yeah, the tuner's real... See how it appears to be real mushy? It doesn't seem to tune anything. It doesn't have enough voltage. Okay. Well, we'll shut that off. Let's bump up to the next bulb I got. It appears to be running okay. I probably could get rid of this. We'll just be safe here. This is a 60 watt bulb. Still pretty mushy. Oh, I heard something. It's trying to oscillate. Well, that's making it pretty crabby. Let me get rid of that. We'll put a 100 watt bulb in there. Yeah, there's about 130 volts. Oh, there we go. It's kind of annoying. Dripping milk, ready to listen. Yeah, still not so much. Trying. The neighbor's dog. Uh -huh. He is barking the same bark, rhythmic bark, 
that he brought. Well, let's fix that up. How about a little contact cleaner? What is that? That's a uh, 6BE6. So that's either an RF amp or a local oscillator. Oh. And what I did there was I shot that with a little general purpose contact cleaner. You can get that, this stuff up at Rat Shack. It's kind of, it's pretty inexpensive. It's kind of cheap, but it's... Uh, you can probably use some alcohol too. The deox would work on there too, but I really don't like spraying that around too much. It's pretty, pretty high priced stuff. If you're going to use it, one of the things I found is I put it in like in a little cap, and uh, I'll use a toothpick to get it out of the cap and then touch the contacts. The stuff seems to have some sort of a kind of a cleaning action, just even touching stuff. Anyway, this is called Lesson for the Day. I didn't know Marion Moore had written a little ode to a steamroller until this morning. She has it walking back and forth over the particles it has crushed. She must have watched... There's another one that's a little grumpy. This is probably an oscillator tube. I'll tell you what, I'm going to shut you off and I'll be back. Oh, we're over here on my uh, other PC. This is a uh, screen capture expressions encoder so if you want to download it and play with it it was free and uh, it's a little tough to find but if you use uh, one of the search engines you can dig it out now don't download Microsoft expressions expressions and expressions encoder are two different things and you want to find the one with uh, it's expressions encoder with service pack 2. I actually can show you that real quick here if you're interested. What we're doing over here is I've uh, worked on that radio that West or that uh, Westinghouse radio and I'm going to look for a schematic. I thought maybe people might be interested how to do that. I get a lot of if this ever gets up and going. Yeah, we'll just make little drawings with the mouse. This is <sighs> the joys of computing. <clears throat> but I thought I would try this program. There have been some times I wouldn't mind uh, showing you some things on the web, how to search for things, and uh, uh, this is another experiment. This is actually what happens in the newest version of Microsoft. Oh, Windows, whatever the browser is here. Hey everybody, today I'm going to show you my <laughs> this is, craft of making aluminum melting. Yeah, and if you uh, close this with uh, leftover, leftover YouTube videos, apparently the audio creeps into your YouTube video. <laughs> That's awesome. What a knucklehead. Okay, so yeah, these are all things I've been doing. Anyway, let's go over here. And we'll open this baby up and use evil Google. So you've got your radio, and this one happens to be uh, Westinghouse. And I believe the model number was H-3070. And there's a couple ways you can search for a schematic or a service manual or a manual on these things. What I usually do is you find the part number and the easiest thing to do is type the word PDF after there. And here we can find some stuff. Uh, there's always people selling these things but we don't want to we don't want to buy one if uh, somebody's got one out in the real world. Yeah, it doesn't look like somebody's... Well, yeah. Here's one. <clears throat> and this site here. 
So H3 right there. And we want to. Now this is right there. Uh, what's called a deja vu file. There are two, pretty much two or three types of potential files, your file types you're going to find when you look for a service manual or a schematic for an old radio. The most common is probably the PDF. The second most common is this deja vu thing, which was free, but it never really took off terribly well. But there's a lot of documents in it. Probably the third thing you'll find is a GIF, and you can download the uh, the deja vu reader. And I've got it, but I don't know if it'll open it. It uh, might be a little grumpy. Nah, I didn't think so. Um, so what you could do is you could save that. Let's just try again here. See if it'll... Anyway, I've saved that. This is a a program. And it's in here somewhere. It's a place called Lizard Tech. I don't make the names up, I just use the programs. Come on. And there's a number of different little versions of this. I've already downloaded this thing. And you want to open it. It's under the downloads, it's right there. And we'll just open it. And there it is, right there. It's kind of weird. Anyway, this is the uh, the file, and uh, usually what I do is I just send this to the printer. Although there actually are three pages here. There's the actual schematic, and here's some documentation on uh, adjusting or lining the radio, and here is just some basic parts stuff. That's the deja vu file. One well, of the other ones you can uh, use is. Uh, I never find this site very often in the searches. I don't know if they've asked Google not to search those. Um, you can do that. There's another one called... Uh, what is that called? Uh, uh, that's it. Nostalgia, I think it's Nostalgia Air. There it is. And uh, this nostalgiaair.org. And you can use references. You can go to the site and find these things too. Google just happens to break this stuff up. And you can thumb through here. And we're looking for Westinghouse, which is clear at the bottom. And. Now, notice that there's some different ones. There's Westinghouse Canada and Westinghouse International and Westinghouse. We're just going to try Westinghouse and we're looking for an H307T. Ooh, right there. These files are, I believed, were scanned out of a giant subscription service manual that you got a, a, a few pages every month. This was, uh, the I believe it's Writer's Service Manual. There's a number of service manuals that were manufactured over the years. There's another one called uh, Most Often Needed, like Servicing for Radios or Radio Servicing. And I've actually got a set of these the, these books, and there's like there's like 20 of these things. And they are huge. They're they make the encyclopedia be the the library version of Encyclopedia Britannica look very tiny, and this is a little unusual. You can look at it here if you've got the PDF reader installed on your PC, and you can save it here. And we'll just look at it because you can save it from the reader, and they've got it. They've got the pages, and there's an yeah, there's a picture of the beast. If you right click on it, you can rotate it. If I'm going too fast, I'm sorry. Oh, there was there was something that was kind of interesting. Yeah, see, there are two part numbers to these radios. The eight for the 308 version is ivory, and uh, there's some other interesting trinkets there. But here's the the PDF. Uh, I'm not going to give you a tutorial on PDF, but uh, PDF readers. But 
you can make them bigger and scooch around and look at the thing here. And here's like the selenium rectifier. Here is the uh, oh, dangerous line cord. See, it's literally tied right to chassis, which is interesting. It's a big no-no. Here's kind of a layout of the, the tubes. Here's that tube we were jacking with. This is FM oscillator, which is over here. Um, you can usually find these schematics to be downloaded. There's a lot of places online that want to peddle one to you or sell one to you, and I don't know. I Here's my theory of those places. My theory is that they've went to places like this with uh, with uh, robots and harvested these and then package them up and put them on CDs and they're making a buck off of somebody else's work. Now, years ago, before the web was really popular, it was a real bear to find a schematic. And those uh, service manuals I bought, those rider service manuals, there are 20 of them and I paid 200 bucks, which at the time, mm, that's probably been 20, I don't know, 30 years ago, easy, were a bargain. I have used and used and used and used those things. And I have lent them out and uh, those type of things. But I, to be honest, I have never reproduced one and sold it. Which I think is kind of a disservice. Um, now, if you draw a schematic from hand or draw some notes from, you know, about a radio from hand, knock yourself out. But if you are bumming a ride on this, this isn't your work. And even though the copyright may have run out, I don't think you're, uh, I don't think you're really entitled to that. That's my opinion, anyway. And uh, there are some, there are some service inf pieces of service information that are really hard to find. Here's that local oscillator tube we were fiddling with. And you can see here that the band switch is down here. Right here, it switches back and forth. Um, this little piece of information right here, this dotted line, is this coax that goes to the volume control. We'll see that coming up here. And it goes up to this, this tube. This is a little experimental. I don't know. This is kind of clunky because what happens is you fire this program up. It uh, it basically captures the screen, then you shut it down, and it saves all your movings. Then you have to you have to send it to an encoder. There's like a couple three pieces. So however long it takes you to do this part, it takes just as long to actually encode it. So I tell you what we'll do here. We'll shut this off. I remember how. It was kind of okay, so you control. got your schematic. You went through a little bit of schematic hell to try and find one. Um, one of the first things you want to do, this might be one of the first things you want to get after you drag the radio home if you're going to work on it. Uh, one of the first things you want to do is sit down and look at it real carefully. And one of the things that really could help you is to sit down and read these notes. And like here it says selector switch 2, which is the AM FM selector switch shown in the AM band position. Extreme counterclockwise position is the FM band. Uh, all voltages measured from chassis ground with a uh, where does that look so blurry 20k ohm volt meter. And yeah, we'll talk about that later. Uh, the line voltage is set at 117. Eh, we're kind of there. Not perfect, but Let's find out where we are. And we're at, yeah, we're a little low. We're at 100, we're about 10 volts low, roughly. We're at 109 volts, so that's not so good. Let's see, all voltages shown are plus or minus 20%. Well, according to the schematic, what else? We got notes here. Let's see, this is number three to be installed for alignment only. C capacitor 38 may be part, may or may not be part of capacitor 29. Okay. Weird. Okay, we saw that. Let's see all capacitor values of microfarad or resistors in ohms unless otherwise specified. Now here's an interesting little tidbit. Here's some different models 
basically have the same chassis. Some of them had record players, some of them were tabletop, some of them were different colors. Very interesting. So it looks like this model had this chassis and it was in a tabletop version and maybe there were some different colors here. Hmm. Well, this one's brown. This is the 307 T7. There's a 308 T7. I bet the 8 was an ivory one. Those are the two popular colors back in the day. So, and I was mostly curious what this tube was. This is the RF oscillator for FM. The crayons. Thousands of them. That volume control being a little scratchy still. And kind of hummy. That's weird. Okay. Let me show you what a hot chassis is. So we got our voltmeter and got it set on AC volts. Okay, so what I've done here is I uh, flipped the line cord around in the back and I've hooked the voltmeter on AC or an AC volts and I've grounded it to the chassis. This lead here actually goes over to the uh, water pipe by the sink. Now if you connect those two leads together very carefully you'll see that I got about 110 volts there. So if you're hanging on to this and brush up against something grounded, you might get a heck of a surprise. Now what I'm going to do is just leave this lay there and reach over and flip the leads around on the back here where the AC comes in. I turn the radio back on and now you'll see that it isn't a hot chassis now. Very, very dangerous. If you use an isolation transformer, what that does is uh, that breaks that circuit or that path, no matter which way the cord's plugged in. It doesn't mean you won't get a shock. It just means it breaks the circuit between the mains or line side of the ground. So it isn't, don't think of a line or an isolation transformer as a uh, get out of jail free card for not getting knocked on your butt. It just means it makes it a little safe and unexpected. Stuff like that will not happen so much. This is the reason today's modern appliances have what they call polarized line cords. Uh, if you take a look at most items, say a lamp or an extension, a uh, two line cord lamp or extension cord, one blade is wider than the other. 
that forces the appliance or whatever to be uh, plugged in the wall a little bit safer. This wouldn't be a problem if the thing, the radio, had a transformer for high voltage. But since we're making this radio as cheap as possible, it, a little element of danger is uh, apparently okay. Actually, what uh, what happens is it's covered up by the uh, plastic chassis, the cardboard back, the plastic knobs, and even those screws. Remember those screws we looked at earlier? They're metal, but they don't screw into a... Uh, the metal of the body there, they screw into here, these little plastic feet. Now there is one little place, there's one little chink in this armor. Remember on the back, we didn't see the screw, but it, it was there. There's a screw right there that goes through into this bracket. Well, this bracket's part of the chassis, so if you touch that screw where my finger is, you know, you could get knocked on your can. So there's a reason that old uh, radios and TVs kind of went away from this. Makes it a little bit safer. Uh, realistically, you shouldn't be in there, probably the, the consumer level shouldn't be in there screwing around anyway. But back then, there was nothing wrong with you taking your back off your radio to put a few new tubes in there. It was probably pretty common practice. People used to fix things on their own. So I'm not sure what we've done here, other than maybe, I don't know, dumb things down for people. Well, this appears to be in pretty good shape. So I guess, uh, there's a couple ways we could go from here. We could uh, give it a good checkup from the neck up. And I could, or I could show you all the things that I would do if, this, say, this was a, a customer or a friend's radio. Um, one of the next things I probably would do is, so I've got the schematic, and there's no problems. Uh, I would consider that a big win, and uh, probably what I would do is I would test all the tubes. I've got a couple tube testers. Um, I probably would. Um, make some notes and I would probably call the customer and tell them here's the status of the thing it does run it's in pretty good shape um, but the choice is yours while I'm in there I can do these things one of the things you could do is replace this rectifier these can be a little notorious and you can replace it with a solid state equivalent but if you do these do have a voltage drop across them and you would have to change or add um, this resistor here it is it looks like a diode because it is and this resistor today's modern bridge or modern I keep calling it a bridge rectifier today's modern rectifiers are way more efficient they don't have so much voltage drop you'd probably have to increase this value to get this 140 volts approximately a little fiddling would be in order it would make the unit more reliable and you could you could leave that in there it doesn't hurt anything you probably would unwire it and hide the the diode down underneath. That would probably be a recommendation I would make to a customer. Me, myself, I kind of like running all that old crap and living on the edge, so I'm going to leave it alone. Uh, one of the other things I would recommend to a customer is uh, I would check out the kind of the alignment and fidelity of the radio. It seems just off the bat, just seems, it seems in pretty good shape. I believe somebody probably took pretty good care of this since they went to the trouble of modifying it. I probably would recommend to the customer that this go bye bye. It's not factory and it is somewhat dangerous. And I probably would take some of my own advice and pull that out of there. One of the other things you could do. I'll tilt this up. Uh, again, this is kind of from the service point. Um, I would sit down and look at the schematic and look all these caps up and uh, see where they're at. And I would probably recommend to the customer, 
or would probably ask the customer what they're planning on doing. Are they planning on keeping this, or they just want to get it up and going for the fun of it, or you know, if they're in it for the long haul, I would probably replace all these. These paper capacitors can uh, break down and leak and cause trouble over the time. And while I'm in here, I might as well do it. A little work will be needed. You know, I'll have to glue this back together. I'm not sure how that was glued on there. Looks like it was just glued on there. Any, any inexpensive glue would work. Oh! I'm trying to see what I got here. Might. Well, we can try this. We can try this glue here. Probably over time, heat will uh, dissolve this glue, but it's nothing major. And we'll just snap that back in place. Looks like it was right about there. Just kind of iron it out. That's a no-brainer. You don't need to call a customer and ask them to put something back together. Trying to see where that... Okay. I bet a dollar that this, this pointer this one here is probably one they had for a number of radios and that's why it looks kind of weird the window or the tuning window on this radio is pretty thin and since we saw in the schematic that this chassis fit other radios they may bend these around to suit their needs I'm gonna leave it alone and see if it when I put the radio back in the chassis see if it fits in there just kind of iron out the felt here it looks pretty good. This really isn't a great example. I'd hope there'd be a few problems. Every once in a while you win big. I'm just taking a brush and kind of patting that down to get it to stick, make sure it sticks. So, depending on what the customer wants to do, you might be replacing those caps. Uh, one of the things I definitely would replace would be these filter caps, this one here. And this one in the drawing it said may or there we go said that this may or may not be part of this one. In this case it is not. And I think the drawing showed it as a what was it? Like twenty microfarad? Yeah. Twenty microfarad. It's uh, on the um cathode of the output tube. So you'd go ahead and replace all that stuff. I'm kind of curious how well this thing will run with this stuff still in there. One of the other things you might do is you might look at some of the voltages while you're in here poking around. Remember the drawing said that uh, everything was referenced from the ground, from the chassis. What do we got here? Here it claims that that this one voltage ought to be about 140 volts. We'll just grab up here and see if that's true. And that's not going to work because I got an oil on its back and unplugged. Okay, hang on a sec. Let's, let's tip her up. It's one of the challenges of radio repair is finding clever ways to hold things. Yeah, about that. Let's see here, we need a little something to stand that up on. Hmm. Yeah. That's not going to work. Hmm. Well, let's see here. Well, I suppose we could flip it up on its back. Let's see if that works. Not that. It's back attached to the radio. It's kind of in the way. 
Mm, this isn't great. This isn't yuck. This isn't going to work at all. How about this side? Does that work? There's no great way to hold this thing up. Hmm. Yeah, that isn't bad. There, I've kind of cheated a little bit. I plugged the back back into the radio and sort of stood it up. Again, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Let's see here. Yeah, that's not a great idea because that cord is really pretty shaky. I think we're going to give that idea up. Hmm. We're going to do this. I'll tell you what, I'll let you go here and we'll be back.